What is paratext? Hi, I'm Doug, and I want to encourage you to learn about paratext as you're studying the biblical languages. Now, paratext is distinct from the text of the Bible itself. So, properly speaking, we're not talking about learning elements of the grammar, the syntax, the vocabulary, the alphabet, or anything like that. We are actually talking about pretty much everything else that we might notice on the page. Dr. Greg Goswell has a recent book published by Lexham Press called Text and Paratext, Book Order, Title, and Division as Keys to Biblical Interpretation. I got this on my Logos Bible software. Highly recommend this book. And this is what he says about paratext. Here's his definition. Paratext may be defined as everything in a text other than the words. That is to say, those elements that are adjoined to the text but are not part of the text itself if text is limited strictly to the words. The paratext of Scripture embraces features such as the order of the biblical books, the names assigned to the different books, and the differing schemes of textual division within the books. Since these elements are adjoined to the text and frame the text, whether a reader notices or not, they have an influence on reading and may assist or sometimes hinder the interpretation of the text of Scripture. Now, as we uh, read the Bible, whether we are reading it or portions of it in translation or whether we are studying it in the original languages, we can't help but notice that the arrangement on the page takes a certain form and can affect our interpretation. The way chapters are broken up, the way verses are divided, uh, whether your Bible spaces out poetry is distinct from prose, all of those things have an effect on us as readers, whether it's conscious or unconscious on our part as we are looking at the text. Now, the earlier witnesses that we have to Scripture, the copies of manuscripts that we have, also have their own form of this paratext. And so we have some very ancient witnesses, and while we could certainly agree that these paratextual elements are not necessarily part of the original, uh, the autographs of Scripture, as it were, they are still important. They are an ancient witness. And if we would let modern editors and scholars influence us, who are much further removed uh, from the text than some of these ancient scribes and scholars, I think we need to step back and say, well, why is that? Why wouldn't I want to pay attention to the way the ancients marked um, the scripture in, in different ways by the arrangement of uh, the order of the books, by the spacing up on the page, and maybe by commentary and notes on the side. Why wouldn't I want to pay attention to that? And I think we should pay attention to those elements as we seek to study the biblical languages. So today we're going to talk about four elements of the paratext that we can study. Now there are more than these, but the four I want to talk about are the canonical placement and book order, then the sense divisions and the sedarim. So the canonical placement has to do, let's say, with an individual book how it's placed somewhere within the canon. The classic example is the book of Ruth. Ruth is found in Christian Bibles, typically after the book of Judges. And it makes sense because the book of Ruth starts right away by acknowledging the time setting of the book, which is in the time of the Judges. And so you've got two books back to back, Judges and Ruth, and you have some overlap. You have Ruth saying it is set within the time period of the previous book. So that would make sense for that canonical placement. Another way to think of it, though, is with the Jewish traditions of where Ruth may be found. And Ruth can be found, for example, after the book of Proverbs. Now, why would that be the case? Well, the book of Proverbs ends in chapter 31 with an acrostic poem going through every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, telling us about this woman of virtue or strength or valor, the virtuous woman or the Eshet Chayil. And when you read through the book of Ruth, you see a description that's talking about Ruth using that exact term, that Eshet Chayil. And then uh, you can see that connection highlighted by the placement of Ruth right after Proverbs. Now, another tradition has Ruth being placed right before the Psalms. Well, how does the book of Ruth end? The book of Ruth ends with this genealogy, this Toledot of David. 
and David is associated, rightly, with the book of Psalms, although he's not uh, attributed uh, as the author for every psalm, of course, but he is closely associated with the book of Psalms and wrote many of them. So you can see the placement of Ruth before Psalms is also making a lot of sense and highlighting that connection of David and how important David is there. So the canonical placement of our books, consciously or unconsciously, can affect our interpretation and can highlight certain aspects of the text. Another related aspect of paratext is book order, and here I'm going to talk about it within a more specific uh, subunit or section. The Minor Prophets is the example I want to use here, or the Book of the Twelve. Now, in the Hebrew Masoretic text, the, the, the Jewish tradition of the Twelve uh, with the Hebrew has a pretty stable order of Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Had to learn a song really well to be able to uh, to rattle those off. But anyway, that order is pretty stable, but it is not the only order. There are certainly witnesses uh, with Greek translation of the Twelve, where there is a variation. But in our Hebrew order, it's been observed by Nagalski and others that there seem to be certain catchwords that obtain between the books that are in that sequence, between Hosea and Joel, between Joel and Amos, and so forth. And so those catchwords, those key words that are repeated, seem to be drawing a connection, making a stitching, as it were, of these books together to say these books belong together. And so the book order can have an effect on our interpretation in that way and how we think of the book of the Twelve. Is it 12 random books that just happen to be put together in a scroll and in a sequence here? Or is there an intentionality to the sequencing of these books. And so that order and observations that can be gleaned from that order make you think about that. Another area of paratext that we need to think about is something called the sense divisions of the text. Now this is often accomplished by spacing. We could also argue that the Masoretic accentuation, the cantillation system, or the ta'ameha mikra, um, the, the te'amim, that those are important aspects of sense division, and I think so. We want to do a whole separate uh, episode or series on those, but today I want to focus on the spacing that uh, there are certain rules for the uh, setumot and the petuchot where you will leave a blank space on the same line for a setuma uh, that's called an, um, a closed section, and then you will have a petuha or an open section where it opens, it has to go down to a new line and open a brand new section. Now, the setuma is a lighter break, a petuha, a stronger break in the text, arguably. But when you look at a Hebrew Bible manuscript, you will see these. This will just jump right off the page. You don't have to know any Hebrew to notice these. But when you do know Hebrew and you can see what is being done with them, it's amazing to see that you may have the beginning of a, a speech introduction, a quotative frame, uh, might be introduced like a vayomer. You might have, for example, in the days of creation, you might have a certain structure that is highlighted by the spacing. And so in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, every day of creation will start with a new space in the Masoretic text tradition there. And that's a pretty amazing thing to see. Now, you have these uh, kinds of space indications in Greek manuscripts, too. You have some Greek manuscripts that have something called uh, ekthesis, where the text is drawn out to the side. You might have a really big uh, letter uh, that'll start to, you know, chi agenito or something like that. And you'll see that highlighted in the text in that way. And that, that makes you pause and say, is there some kind of a highlighting here? Is this scribe saying this is an important section here? Is it saying here's where you can find your place? Is it saying this is a hard break in the text? These are questions that one needs to ask when studying this, because consciously or unconsciously, it affects the way we process the text and the way we interpret the text. And then uh, we have talked about the canonical placement, the book order, the sense divisions. We need to talk about the, the sedarim for the Hebrew tradition anyway, for the Hebrew Bible tradition. You have these different reading cycles. Now, we could certainly look at it in terms of uh, Christian lectionaries as well, uh, where you have this sort of thing as well. But whether Jewish reading cycles or Christian lectionaries, you can look at the grouping, you know, what is 
considered part of a large or small reading cycle. When you look at the book of Genesis, for instance, you've got the first verse going down through chapter 6, verse 8, uh, and then you get uh, Parashat Noach. And so Noah's uh, Toledot in Genesis 6, 9 begins a brand new section. Now Noah's been introduced, he's been discussed in the previous one, but this impacts the way we look at the uh, text and the way it's divided up and the way we interpret it. And we see Genesis 1, 1 through 6, 8 as some some kind of a unity here in this system. Now you can look at smaller divisions. Some people debate about where to break the text with the creation account in Genesis 1. Does it break at chapter 2, verse 3? Does it break at chapter 2, verse 4? Well, things like the, the Sedarim will give us some, some hints at, at least as to how other people have seen this in antiquity. And so when you look at these reading cycles, the Minor Prophets is another example too. They'll, they'll span different books at times. This is important to back up and look at that and say, hey, how did they divide the text up? What is this saying? What did they group together? What did they separate? All of these things affect our interpretation. And we can uh, do this through a variety of means. We can certainly use our critical editions, uh, the BHS or the uh, the N.A. or the Tyndale House Greek New Testament, we can certainly see some indications there. And the Tyndale House Greek New Testament is particularly consciously trying to pay special attention to these issues of, of spacing. And I think that's uh, that's very commendable. Uh, we can also look, though, at manuscript images and I highly commend using manuscript images. Now, I understand that uh, paleography and orthography and, and you know, these aspects, the, the, these whole disciplines of being able to recognize the handwriting of people of antiquity and to be able to distinguish sometimes between different scribes and so forth. This is a specialized discipline. We understand that. But there's still a lot, even as beginners, you can start to notice and pick up on. And it may be a good area for you to consider for advanced study as well. But when you compare the manuscript images to the critical scholarly edition at times, sometimes you will see some things in the paratext that are obscured, washed over altogether, or totally different in the printed version versus a manuscript like the Leningrad Codex or Codex uh, Sinaiticus. So I encourage you to, to get on websites uh, where these are hosted, check these out, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's just so many things that we can notice about the layout of the text on the page when we have those witnesses, and we can be more and more conscious about how these issues of the sequence of the books, how the spacing, and how the grouping of reading cycles and passages together like that affect our interpretation of the text and can give us some hints. Now, again, this is not part of the original text, but these are ancient witnesses and their voices deserve to be heard in this process as we just join this long conversation of reading these texts and seeking to interpret them the best we can. So I hope you will include paratext in your efforts to be studying the biblical languages. Shalom. Pay attention to paratext when you're studying the biblical languages.